Would you stand as you're able for our prayer of illumination and for the reading of the gospel? Pray with me. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy and obey with gladness what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, 14 and 15, and 21 through 23. Here as God speaks to us. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it was written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to human traditions. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexuality, sexual immor immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Traditions, we all have them. They are a part of who we are even as a body of Christ and as people who identify themselves as God. Let, or godly, not God. Some of you might do that too, bad, all right. But last week we had a tradition here and I did not even know it until afterwards. At a gathering, people were debating and saying how others missed out because a choir anthem song, I believe it's called Rivers of Judea. Is that what it was? Okay, so, in this congregation, when you hear that sung, it must trigger some kind of experience, attachment to the holier things. Now, you want to know a little secret? Jenny and I had never heard that. Oh, shame on us, right? Don't you feel, look at all you bow on your head. Oh, Lord, send them back. <laughs> they are from someplace far, far off. Now, I do know Fanny Crosby's song, Blessed Assurance, right? Jesus is mine. I, I said a little amen to that, even if we do have quiet people in the congregation. We have a tradition, though, that maybe you have never experienced. It's called Krebs, Oklahoma. K-R-E-B-B-S. It's a little town just north of McAllister, which is basically the furthest away that you can get from Altus, Oklahoma, and still be in Oklahoma. And some of you have ever been to Krebs and be like, that's not Oklahoma. No, you'd say, that ain't Oklahoma, but it is, all right? In fact, it was there longer than here as an established community. The thing that they have going for them is the very thing that a lot of people initially said they had wrong with them. It's a place of immigrants still to this day. I don't even know if half of them converted yet to be called American. 
They're Italian, or as my grandfather would call them, the Italians. And someone would try to correct him and say, no, it is. And he'd say, no, they, they are Italians. I dated one back in Chicago once when I was up there in the Navy. She went by Italian. All right, so, but when the coal fields played out, they had to make a living. And so what they did is they brought their cuisine to the general population. Oh, I do love me some Italian food, right? <laughs> and we go down every year after Christmas. They know that we're Methodist clergy and we'll be coming in the day after Christmas. They expect to see us there. And I want to tell you what they bring out before you receive your entree. We go to this one called Isla Capri. They bring out salad that's just drenched in this wonderful olive oil. Oh, oh and the bread. Oh, can you smell it? Let's go to eat, right? Oh my goodness, it's so good. It's got garlic on it, keeps the vampires away, all those other traditions we have. Fantastic, but then they bring out these little slices of Munster cheese with little chocolates that you're supposed to save for after, but we always eat them with. And, and then they bring out a bowl of spaghetti and ravioli. This is still all the appetizer if you go in the evening. Then comes out your entree, but before your entree comes out, they bring in French fries. French fries at an Italian restaurant. That does not make sense to me. How about to you? So I asked this waitress one time. She would been there. She'd been waiting tables a little bit more than I am old. So I said, how do you have French fries here? And she said, well, my great-grandfather who opened the restaurant, one time the delivery guy had a whole bunch of potatoes and nothing else, so he cut them up, served them, and they've always been a hit. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. And she says, it doesn't matter. It's a tradition, right? <laughs> Sometimes our traditions make no sense. I, I had no problem eating french fries because as a kid growing up in a semi-truck on Citizens Band Radio, y'all ever have CBs? I, had, I, I got me a handle based on the old saying, what you, you are, what you eat. You know what my CB handle was? French fry kid. All right, so I have no problem eating french fries at Italian restaurants, no matter how weird it is. If you go there, save room for dessert, they got this bourbon pecan pie that's literally intoxicating. You won't want to miss it, all right? <laughs> if I was what I really eat, that old saying, ever since I've come to Altus, I've eaten a ton of steak and a lot of sweet things. So now I'm going by beefcake, all right? So you can just <laughs> call me that from here on out. But if I really was to engage your traditions, I'd be called peachy right now. Y'all have a tradition around here, right? Cunningham peaches have come to town. I mean, they had like a parade or something. People were, do you know, the peaches are coming, the peaches are coming. I'm, I'm like, oh, let's get armed for battle, you know? They're, I thought the peaches was the people from the other side of the river or something. <laughs> if I was what I eat, I'd be called a vegetable. Have some of y'all been calling me a vegetable without me knowing? Because if you leave your car door unlocked around here, you're going to end up with some okra, some squash, and some cucumbers right now, right? If I was what I eat, I'd be named what my son is going to be called Porky right now because I called him and I said, hey, guess what? We're being sold here. And he said, what? I said, that blue and gold sausage. He said, that farmer town sausage? Because we didn't have that out there, but he's had it from his grandma and grandpa's and Thankfully to the ag program here and having Methodist kids, I've I got to take up another offering to pay for my blue and gold sausage orders, all right? <laughs> we are literally what we consume. That's who we become. I have tried, searched the scriptures, and nowhere can I find, thou shalt eat homemade ice cream in the summertime. <laughs> but it's a pretty good tradition, isn't it? Can y'all not say amen to homemade ice cream? If you can't say amen to that, I don't know what to do with y'all, all right? <laughs> Nowhere in the scriptures can I find, thou shalt eat chili to start the fall season of Bible studies. But it sounds like a pretty good tradition to me. Family Life Committee is one of those things that not other churches have that I've ever been a part of. You can be participating in one at two o'clock today. The whole goal is to take our traditions and make them even better at being effective for the kingdom of God. That's what traditions are intended to do. We have a great tradition here. 
We have some things going well. Some of those traditions may be switching times because we believe and affirm the tradition that is no longer in the scripture, but is identified as training up children in the way they should go, paying attention to the ordinances of God, a little tradition called Sunday school. Did y'all ever have a Sunday school superintendent around here? Did they come around with like a ruler and chasing you? Get to class, ring a bell. All different modes of traditions, they are worthwhile, but our traditions could also consume us and become dangerous. That's what happened to the Pharisees and the scribes who had come up to see Jesus from Jerusalem. They had had a steady diet of tradition. Some of those traditions are actually rooted in Scripture. One of those being dietary restrictions all throughout Leviticus and in Numbers. And, and some of those were like, you can't eat snakes. Don't go tell the people at Mangum that. I know once a year y'all are like, fry one of those puppies up for me, I'll eat it. Y'all might be burning someplace, right? Now, it's a tradition for the first century Jews in particular, which Jesus was a rabbi in that season. You don't eat snakes. You don't eat animals with the cleaved hoof. In other words, pigs represented a moral flaw in the sense we still think of them today. They're defiled. They're dirty. They're muddy, right? Oh, I believe we could have world peace with bacon cheeseburgers, though. <laughs> but do you think that Jesus abided by the kosher laws of his day? Of course he did, because they are ordinances of God. Now, how do we get to the point of eating bacon and blue and gold sausage? I say, praise God from whom all blessings flow, right? <laughs> Traditions change. The word of God remains the same. How then are we able in good faith as Christ followers to partake of things that our Jewish counterparts might not? Some of it's tradition, some of it's scripture, a lot of it's interpretation of scripture. The big argument, the Pharisees and the scribes are viewed as the antithesis of Jesus' authority as a rabbi. And therefore, they come up to him while he is in a crowd and they notice something about his disciples that they were eating and breaking bread. Kids, close your ears right now, all right? Without washing their hands, according to them. <laughs> what do we tell our kids they always have to do? Wash up, get clean, right? But were their hands, you can unplug now, kids, all right? Were the disciples' hands dirty? Can y'all answer that? They were deemed impure or defiled because they had not followed the ritual hand washing. It doesn't mean that they were all grubby pod, but I mean, to be honest, when I would day out as a plow hand, most of the sandwiches I ate always tasted like red dirt and had iron in them, is what I'd tell mom. Washing the hands, there was this ritual that's in the Talmud called the mikvah, where you'd have to take your hands and dip them like seven times, and then you'd do this, and then you'd dip them again. I mean, ain't nobody got time for that, right? But if you're going to be a holy person, you would do that. It says also that they wash their pottle, pots and their kettles. If you have a Bible open right now, you will notice that most of that, verses 2 and 3, may be in a bracket or a parenthesis because that is an interpretation not necessarily found in some of the most ancient of manuscripts. It is for us to have a context. It was never deemed for us to say, oh, that's why they would say and do what they did. But when we hear that read, we think immediately that's the crux of the argument. The crux of the argument is actually in verse 8 where it's talking about neglecting the commandments of God in order to hold fast to the traditions of men. Let's say that we said no longer will we have an ice cream social on a Sunday evening. Instead, we had a better idea. No worship on Sunday, but ice cream every Sunday. Amen! Right? I could get some of y'all to buy it. You'd be like, oh, I'm following that guy, right? That would be ignoring the commandment to keep the Sabbath holy, right? And therefore, that would be a violation. 
the argument, even the Apostle Paul had this when he wrote to the church at Corinth about, could you eat meat that had been sacrificed to somebody else as a false god? Paul leaned on the side of, of course you can. But not everybody was happy with that decision. That's the thing about traditions. They become ingrained in us to the point where we might make a mountain out of a molehill. That's what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing. They were trying to shame Jesus so that they could be identified as those who are set apart and therefore holy. And this guy, they are right. He must be wrong. What if we admitted instead of a steady diet of traditions that we're all full of it sometimes? Did you know that? I'm full of it. You're full of it. Give you a perfect example. Last night we went to see the musical Oklahoma because Nick and Morgan were performing in that. And pretty awesome job. Good job. All right. It was pretty amazing. And what, before we went there, though, we had to do our sacramental duty and stop out at a Mexican restaurant that they have in Oklahoma City, Tulsa, and Lawton. You might know this place. They have this vegetable relish. Oh, so good. I mean, it's almost like Italian food, <laughs> but it's not. And it has carrots in there and raw onions and jalapenos, and so I always get that. And I was good last night. I only had one because I usually get three. And uh, then, they, you know, since I identified my new nickname, y'all remember my new nickname? Beefcake, right? Uh, you got it, Beefcake. Yeah, I knew y'all would like calling me that. So they offer you chicken or steak. Guess which one I took? Beef, and it had pico in it. And I ate all that, and I saved some room for a sopapilla because at the end you're going to learn that you're all supposed to be like honey, right? So, uh, so I, I ate all that. And in the ancient world, they would say your heart was down here. See how big my heart is? <laughs> big heart for God, all right? It's not what goes into a man, it's what comes out. And I just got a large heart for God. And uh, when I eat all those raw onions, see, they used to think that your, your heart was down here, and I believe they were true. We should give the pledge like this. Because when I lay down after eating all those onions, guess what I have? Heartburn. It's connected to here, right? It, it truly is what Jesus would argue and say that we didn't go over was all that goes through the digestive tract and it ends up in the sewer because we're all full of it. Everybody has stuff that stinks. And that's, therefore, it's not what's out there that defiles a man. It's what goes in here that defiles us. Do we have a heart for God? He pointed out their hypocrisy by quoting from Isaiah what we'd call the 29th chapter of Isaiah by saying, Isaiah prophesied correctly or rightly so, saying, you hypocrites. Ooh, hippos, the Greek for putting on a mask in a theater, being something that you're not. You hypocrites, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far away. In other words, he said, your worship's in vain. Because you care more about the precepts and doctrines of men. That's a harsh critique from Jesus our Lord. And he goes on to tell them how they were literally doing that. We didn't read about it. It's called Gorbin. Archaeological digs have actually uncovered lids that had Gorbin in Hebrew on them. And all it was was saying, I'm going to set aside some money for God. Now, don't think that's a bad thing. It's how they used Gorbin that was bad. You know that little command, honor thy father and mother? You know what the consequence of not honoring your father and mother was back in the day? You shall be stoned at the city of gate. I call that population control. We should re-implement that, right? I always remind my mother that I don't want to be the oldest son. Because in Jewish tradition, the oldest son was responsible for the parents whenever they came to a point where they couldn't Contain, you know, control their own lives and maintain their livelihood, the oldest was expected to step in. And so they start, oldest children, oldest sons are really smart. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, yeah. Some brother's going, you're not really that smart, but the other one knows better. So um, they started getting real sneaky. They found a loophole. They said, I can set aside some of my wealth, and I can call it an offering for God, or what they'd say is Gorbin. Jesus pointed that out as, you're just trying to get out of your responsibilities. Oh, shame on us, right? So he said, you really don't care about the precepts and the commandments of God. You care more about your own human 
teachings. And then he goes on to talk about the things that are outside of God, not defiling us, but the things that come in us going out is what defiles the man because it's what's in the heart. That's when he starts talking about we are what we eat. What do we consume? Do we consume mass media through the internet? Do we consume materialism? Do we consume cable news? Do we consume perhaps worshiping our own families? We, we get caught up in all of these traditions when we're supposed to be consuming and internalizing the very word of God. Remember why I have this Bible? I got pretty excited about reading and studying scripture. My friend who was in my Sunday school class, because I see his name whited out there, see? That was his name, Curtis Harris. Pray for Curtis Harris. Pray for Brandy that's been married to him for 30 years. I'm glad he gave me the gift. I'm glad his aunt gave him the gift. Curtis did get fired up about studying the word. It just took a couple of years. We're all on different planes and paths. We need grace. We don't need the things that defile us like fornication and slander and pride and foolishness and lying and stealing, all these things that Jesus names. But we are to proclaim the good news. That is what is to come from inside us to the outside of us. So when they bring you that sopapilla at that Mexican restaurant, you cannot eat it without honey. Did you know that? If you do that, they will kick you out and charge you double. It's against the rules. You got to put a little honey on it. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 3. The Lord said to Ezekiel, calling him son of man, which is a very high Christological term. In fact, Jesus usually identified himself as son of man. He said, O oh, son of man, take this scroll, eat it, and fill your stomach. So when the son of man, Ezekiel, took and fed himself the scroll and filled his stomach, he said that it tasted upon his lips as sweet as honey. I love being back here to where when I go and sit down at a restaurant, the waitress comes over. It bothers me when it's a waiter. But when the waitress comes over and says, hey, honey, how are you doing today? I just love it. And I have to tell Jenny, I did not know her in high school. Okay? Because <laughs> she gets all jealous. Like, how do you know her? Well, I'm beefcake. I mean, how can you not get this response? We're all to be sweeter than how we have become. We can get so vile. We can get so wrapped up in our arguments, our traditions. The churches have them. We have a tradition where we serve grape juice instead of wine. Some churches will tell us that we shouldn't be dancing. And I say, and y'all say, yeah, we shouldn't be dancing. All right. Some churches will say we can't have instrumental music. Some churches will say you can't have fun. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We have our differences but this we should be sure of. We should be as sweet as the word of God that we consume. That's why we want to have an experience together next week. 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock is when this service will meet. The gathering's really excited because they show up. Their service starts at 925. It's really 915, but it starts at 925. They'll already be here for Sunday school if they get up at their usual time. For some of you, the 1040 group in particular, what time does this service start? No, it's 1029 because now I've been caught three weeks in a row back at the back harassing the ushers. And I'm told, let's move ourselves into a place of worship. Jerry, that is you. <laughs> All I'm hearing is beefcake. Would you come forward now? All right. We're starting to try some new traditions. One of those will be that the traditional worship experience will be at 9 a.m., which is great because we gather, we congregate, we celebrate the Lord as we have done traditionally. And then at 10 a.m., there are five adult Sunday school classes, two children's, one youth. We've got it covered womb to the tomb. So if you're dead in your faith, we still have a Sunday school class for you. Okay, if you've yet to be born again, made alive, we have a Sunday school ministry for you. It's a tradition worth valuing because it's based upon consuming this like Ezekiel did, making us all a little sweeter. 
We're trying to change a tradition here at First United Methodist Church. The first Sunday of the week, it's a great tradition to come forward, receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and to kneel at the altar. And you know where we're supposed to kneel at all the time? At the altar. So have we incorporated a tradition that you're like, oh, I guess I should go up there and pray. Have some of y'all felt that and you haven't been obedient to that? Ah, the tradition of sitting on our hands has to stop. That's how you defile them. That's how you end up with the impure hands. What goes in the stomach comes out. Quit sitting on your hands. Jesus was wanting to tell the Jewish people there is good news for everybody. And it has nothing to do with kosher laws and how we distinguish ourselves. It has everything to do with a Savior has come to us. There is grace. I want to talk about proceeding forth with grace. See, Jesus was tempted in all the synoptic gospels by the devil. He'd been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Man, he was hungry. And he desired to be fed. And Satan said, well, tell these stones to turn to bread. And Jesus had a great response. Man does not live on bread alone, but everything that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's what we need to be taking in. And that's what we need to be sharing. And we need to do it with the taste of honey. James, the, the, the epistle of James, the letter of James. Do you know that Martin Luther... Martin Luther, infamous Reformation guy, did not want to include the letter of James in his canonical Bible. You are going, what? Yeah, no, he thought it was too legalistic. I want you to hear some words from the first chapter of James, verse 19. Therefore, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and even slower to anger. Err, right? Y'all know how I make my living? You ever think about that? What do I do every week? I talk, right? That's all a sermon is. It's good talk. What's supposed to be in that talk, though? Things about God, the holy, the divine, a challenge. My mama used to say to me, and this is how she'd say it, I don't know why. I've always been a talker. She'd say, Jerry Don, the Lord gave you one mouth and two sets of ears. Well, two ears. I probably got another set somewhere that I'm not claiming. Two ears. Do y'all know what the moral of that story is? Listen twice as much as you talk. Throughout the week, as I consume the Word of God, I'm listening for God to speak in and through His Scripture, which is authoritative, so that I might have a way of relating it to you on Sunday mornings. But to do that, I must be listening more than I talk. You know how hard that is for me? That's challenging, okay? Very challenging. It may be true of a lot of Methodist people. That is why we give you ice cream. We're like, here, take this, you need it. Here's some chili. Here's some peaches. Here's some okra, right? What comes out of our mouth is very important to our community. I want Altus to hear that the Methodist people understand the Holy Scripture to be the divinely inspired Word of God, as John Wesley would say, containing all things necessary for salvation. I want the community to Altus to hear when those people speak, it's in truth and love. I hear those people speaking in word and deed. Their words are like honey on the lips. We are what we eat. That's why I choose to call y'all honey today. Let's pray. Lord, We'd never want to think of ourselves as Pharisees or scribes, legalistic, but it's the identifier of people who are religious in the days of Christ. They wanted to embarrass you and take away your authority, but you gave them a pretty good talking to. 
you showed them a better way. Lord, help us to walk in that better way. Forgive me, Lord, when I've been a hypocrite, when I've honored you with my lips, but everything else said that my heart was not with you, when I've worshiped you in vain because I failed to humble myself by keeping your commands and just seeking the teachings of men. Lord, we are all responsible for teaching. We're all responsible for learning. But it is with the equipping of your Holy Spirit that we can be gracious people. That everybody throughout Altus would say, Oh, those Methodists, they're sweet people. I just love them. Lord, that's my prayer. And that next week as we gather and some traditions are changed in the sense of a time, and I just want to thank you for the graciousness of your people, that it would be something that would glorify you, not in one service, not in two service, but in service for all of your creation. And that we would take time to be made holy. That we would, as we get up a little earlier next week, say, you know, I'm already here. I might as well go to Ralph and Mike's class or maybe Emily's or, or Robert's or Johnny's or send my kids to Sunday school class. Why not? And that we would all be ready to hear and to study this, your word, the truth, the commandments, the laws of God, that we all need grace to help to fulfill. Thank you, Lord, for feeding our souls this day. Everything that proceeds from the mouth of God, we consume now at this time. In the mighty name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.